Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, and I want to kick things off with just a few housekeeping rules, uh, being that there is language translation for Portuguese available. So on channel one, you'll have English, and on channel seven, you'll have Portuguese language translation. Uh, and we are very honored to have with us here today the Executive Director of the UN Office on Drugs on Crime, Kara Wally, and the UN Depu Women Deputy Executive Director, Ad Interim, Sarah Hendricks. Um, my name is Shane Bovell, uh, and I am a futurist, which means I study the future for a living. And that's a field that's often misconceived as peering into the distant years ahead, when the reality is the future is all around us. It's the culmination of the actions we take in the present. So the realities we're witnessing today, the escalating climate crisis, the relentless progression of climate change, it's a stark reminder of the consequences of past decisions, and it serves as compelling call to action for us to forge a different path. But while we often think of climate change in terms of rising levels of seawater or increasing temperature, we will learn today this is not where the story ends. Violence against women and girls remains one of the most pervasive human rights violations in the world. So the question becomes, what happens when this enduring crisis collides with the colossal force of climate change? So as we embark on our journey together today, let us remember that the future doesn't just happen to us. We get to co-create it. So we can take what we learn today and turn these challenges into tomorrow's triumphs. And with that, let's dive further into today's topic, and we're going to kick things off with a video that sets the stage of why we're here today. Why is climate change contributing to increasing gender-based violence? Well, one way to think about this is that climate change is a threat multiplier. That means that the impacts of climate change amplify and exacerbate existing conditions, including the dynamics that are already risk factors for gender-based violence, poverty, including due to resource scarcity, and gender inequality chief among them. When there's droughts in a lot of countries and communities in the global south, women are usually the ones responsible for fetching water for their families, which makes them often more vulnerable to gender-based violence and sexual harassment. Further, when we're talking about food scarcity as a result of climate change, many families send their kids for child marriages, which ends up exacerbating gender-based violence as well. In 2020 alone, Belize experienced three natural disasters which severely affected the western and southern parts of the country. These are the areas where most of the indigenous people in Belize reside. This led to loss of crops, loss of income, and an increase in gender violence. El impacto del cambio climático en las mujeres se está sintiendo sobre todo a nivel psicoemocional. Los daños que ha dejado con las tormentas que han pasado por Honduras afectan no solo lo material, sino las necesidades físicas y emocionales de las compañeras. La pérdida de la casa, la pérdida de los enseres y aumenta los niveles de pobreza y también aumenta el cuidado sobre otras y otros. These are some of the reasons why we relate the climate crisis to gender equality. And this is why we say that we cannot achieve climate justice without achieving gender equality. We know that climate change is deeply linked with violence against women and girls. But specifically from your perspectives as global leaders, how do you see these connections and why are they so often overlooked? So thank you very much for hosting us today. And thank you for uh, this important question. Indeed, the climate justice and gender justice are indivisible. And every time you have a climate disaster, the reports of UN Women tell us that women, uh, it's, it's 14 times more deadly for women and children whenever you have a climate disaster. So uh, with climate disasters, with climate change, we see more droughts, we see uh, more um, incidents that cause women to leave or cause women to do an extra effort, as we have heard, to fetch water or this or that. So this last year, we've seen 100 million human being being displaced. It's mm -hmm. the highest number ever. A large portion is women. 
when women are on, displaced, are on the move, they have less access to justice systems. Uh, when women are displaced and on the move, they are more um, vulnerable to human trafficking, mm. to being uh, also vulnerable to smugglers. They are also uh, at risk of violence against women, of um, different types of exploitation. Whenever poverty is on the rise due to climate change or other reasons, it's women who suffer the most because of poverty. So in rural women uh, are, are, are at higher risk. Indigenous women are at higher risk. And all these uh, climate disasters which are causing displacement, as I said, would lead to trafficking in persons, smuggling of migrants, or also add a lot to the mental health of women and the pressure that they're exposed to. You see early marriages and child marriages. You see a lot of uh, women being vulnerable to um, aggression and uh, even domestic violence is on the rise because of the economic pressure. So you see more women are vulnerable and more women exposed to uh, domestic violence. We know that only 12% of the SDGs are met. So on every single SDG dimension, uh, we are behind. And when it comes to climate, we're very, we're very much at risk. So the threats are very real. Mm -hmm. And the threats are happening everywhere, um, regardless of the type of climate crisis you have. Also, at the time of crisis in general, women have left less access to justice. Mm -hmm. So they have no place to go to, to complain from, and to access justice. So in those settings, women are the weak link. Great, thank you, very informative, and past to you. Thank you so much. And just to add some thoughts uh, to that, we see that climate change and environmental degradation very much magnify the risks that women face in terms of violence. The link is, if you will, undeniable. We see that displacement, food insecurity, economic stress, even the, the role of poverty that heightens due to climate change, all of these are factors that leave women and girls much, much more vulnerable to violence against women and girls. And as Gada has just said, we also know that women and girls don't necessarily report violence, especially in situations mm -hmm. of crisis, especially in climate-induced uh, disasters. Violence against women and girls is so often hidden around the world, hidden away. Um, survivors already face tremendous difficulties in reporting crimes. And so this is true on the normal basis. It's even more true in climate-induced crisis and disaster risk settings. Um, and this is true in the ways in which services also break down. So survivors aren't supported to access those services, survivors of violence. I'll just add two more quick points. And one is just a reminder that women's environmental human rights defenders, they also face unique vulnerabilities to violence. They um, play such a critical role as activists, and yet they are sometimes the most at risk. And just a data point on that, in Mexico and Central America, there were almost 1,700 acts of violence against women environmental human rights defenders in just three years. This is unacceptable. It, it, it must stop. And it's another way in which violence and, uh, and climate are so deeply connected. Finally, a note about data. We're speaking with a sense of confidence that, that there is this inseparable link. And I assure that that is true, but we need to further know more about these links. We need more information on the prevalence of violence in these contexts. We need to understand how that actual linkage between climate change and violence intersects with each other. Um, we need to ensure this so that there are evidence-based policies that can actually make a difference in women and girls' lives in intangible ways. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great point because I think it, it makes things challenging to improve or overcome what you can't entirely measure. Uh, so filling in those data gaps is critical. So we know the importance of this issue. We know it's a critical topic. We know countries are starting to make some investments. But what do we need to do to accelerate that and accelerate our objectives and, and goals towards the SDGs more broadly? 
Can you repeat this last part? Yes, yeah, so uh, you know, we know that countries are starting to mobilize and make some moves on overcoming some of these challenges. We've seen some of the investments that they've been starting to make, especially we've seen through, through Spotlight Initiative. But what can we do to build on this uh, and to accelerate some of these solutions, especially as we're halfway now to the SDGs? So in our work, we are focused, our mandate focuses on very specific reforms. We're uh, focused on ending and addressing crimes against the environment. And those crimes are very specific. We're talking about, for instance, pollution. How can pollution affect resources? How can pollution affect fisheries? How can pollution affect livelihoods? So ending pollution. Also crimes that lead to loss of biodiversity. Uh, so this and this loss of biodiversity affect the environment. We're also addressing issues like deforestation, like links between climate and environment crimes and other crimes, organized crimes such as drug trafficking, for instance, or human trafficking and other forms of illicit trade. So what we are doing in our work is to strengthen the criminal justice system from beginning to end. You want in the front line. You want to have to see people in the front lines who can come to the rescue of women, who women can approach. You want to see more women police officers. You want to see more women prosecutors. You want to see more women in the justice sector. So you need more inclusion of women in the whole thread of criminal justice. You also want to look at legislation. And in drafting legislations, in parliaments, in designing policies, you want to see more women at the table because they bring to the forefront the concerns of women and the challenges that women are facing. So you want to end this cycle of violence by also investing in data. And we're happy to work with you and women on more data, more research, more statistics. We know from our femicide and female homicide report that over 48,000 women of all female homicides are committed by family members. So the assumption that home is a safe place is not there anymore. So you need to be more aware of the challenges. We know that 80% of those displaced because of climate crises are women. So we have some data. We need to dig deeper in the data and avail this data and make it known, raise awareness of parliamentarians, make place legislation is in place, and then strengthen institution. Another area of important work is working with civil society. I think NGOs and civil society are partners where women can find a lot of support and can bring the voice of women and their, uh, uh, the challenges they're facing forward. So all these are things that we are uh, trying to do. While we know, all of us, that girls and women are facing more barriers for access to justice, for access to finance, I think investing in educating women and providing them with skills will also empower them to face the different climate crises. Okay, thank you. Would you like to add in remarks? Yeah, thank you so much. All of the points that Gada has just highlighted are so critical. And allow me to just add that for the very first time last year, the Commission on the Status of Women looked at the specific issue of gender equality in the context of climate change, environmental degradation, and disaster risk reduction for the very first time in 66 years. And within that, Governments of the world came together and aligned on agreed conclusions, and one of those was an acknowledging the important link between climate change and violence against women. And so we do have alignment by member states, by governments, to act, to act specifically in five areas that were outlined in the CSW agreed conclusions. One on strengthening normative and legal frameworks. The second on integrating gender perspectives into climate change and environmental policies. The third on expanding gender responsive finance. The fourth on enhancing gender statistics and data. And the fifth on ensuring a gender responsive just transition. We know that's been a major topic of focus here at COP28. I think it's one thing for member states to be in a room and to make these agreements. We need to translate those agreements from a global level to national level policy. And so we must hold governments accountable to these commitments and really press forward by supporting governments to integrate measures to prevent violence against women within their climate change policy. 
I have a data point that is both encouraging but also concerning. And that is that there are, under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, six countries that have given attention to gender-based violence in their nationally determined contributions in their NDCs. So there's six governments out there who have done this. Let's celebrate those six, but at the same time, six is far too low. We know much more needs to be done to have more countries follow that example. Thank you. Powerful numbers, and as you said, on the one hand, it seems a bit alarming, but it also provides those six countries a blueprint um, and a proof of concept. It can be done, and now the rest just need to follow suit. What would you like or be your message to folks in this room here today? What can they take forward? And how can they better integrate gender-based violence into the everyday work that's being done to address the climate crisis? So the message to the member states, to civil society, to the private sector, to all stakeholders is to, first of all, the, the link between gender and climate is real, is, is, is known, is established even with the small amounts of data that we have. They need to unite and act and start delivering. And this call for action has started in COP27 in Sharm el-Sheikh and has continued uh, in, in this COP, COP28. So a call for action and implementation because this is what is expected from us. Um, enough discussion of the risks. The risks are real. They're around us. They're everywhere. Uh, we need to act. We need for us to act and, and to be true to what we say governments and financial institutions need to dedicate the needed resources because to act you need resources but also to act you need institutions so you need to strengthen institutions and have there the infrastructure that can provide the services needed for women that can protect and help women and respond to their needs but i think also prevention is very important so while at cops we always speak about adaptation and mitigation and and so on i think prevention is very important and prevention happens with a awareness with more empowered women, with more educated girls and women, but also with a more able justice sector that can respond to women's needs. So again, investing and building capacities in preventing and addressing gender-based violence. I think one element that we haven't discussed is the link between climate crises and conflict. Often climate crises lead to conflict, and we see conflicts everywhere, in Africa, in other places of the world. We see conflict, and during conflict, post-conflict, women are, again, the weak link. And gender-based violence is very much present during conflict, and sometimes as a tool in this conflict. And uh, oftentimes after the conflict, where you don't have access to services, you don't have institutions, where governments are not paying attention to women's needs, they're more paying attention to reconstruction and rebuilding, and women are not taken into account. So while climate leads, climate crisis would lead to conflict, conflict will lead to displacement, displacement leads to women being more vulnerable, and it's this vicious cycle that we need to uh, address. We need to continue working uh, at, at the very local level, we, with women grassroots organization, with women indigenous groups, with rural women, because we can't speak about women as one big homogenous groups with the same needs everywhere. So different women have different needs, but all women are vulnerable whenever there is a climate crisis or whenever there is uh, conflict. What UNODC is doing is working at all levels of the criminal justice system, working with women police officers, prosecutors, judges, and to make women feel safer and come forward to ask for those services. Also, as I said, civil society has an important role to play. And I think technology can also help. We need to become more innovative in bringing women closer, closer to services using technology. So together, we need to start discussing how can we make technology one of those tools to strengthen women and help them have access to justice. And one of the accelerators of the SDGs is access to justice. It was mentioned in the SDG summit that for us to reach the SDGs and for us to rescue the SDGs, access to justice and rule of law are very, very important for women and men alike. Thank you. Very powerful remarks. Yes. Yeah, so what would I leave with people in the room? I think to really recognize this critical and indisputable link between ending violence against women and its connection to a sustainable green planet. This, number one, is foundational. 
Secondly, to build on the important message God mentioned with, let's not forget conflict context. And so this link must be addressed across humanitarian, across conflict, across development, across peace building, across the climate change continuum. And to do that, this requires cross-sectoral and multi-sectoral partnerships and cooperation at all levels. This does mean that we need evidence-based policies and we need to unlock investment into flexible and adaptive financing, especially financing that reaches grassroots women's organizations who are standing at the front lines responding to violence against women and girls in all of its forms from both a prevention as well as a response perspective. And I think this also requires that national authorities driving climate change and disaster prevention policies, that they work side by side with national women's machineries. We see far too many silos um, within government and across. We need more side by side work between the environmental ministry, national women's ministries, local women's organizations. Oftentimes, gender machineries, local women's organizations, they're not invited or they're not at the table sufficiently in climate change related discussions and decisions. So we need to really build up those multi-stakeholder discussions and include women in all their diversity um, so that there are um, multifaceted voices that are driving an awareness, but also clarity on the policy response on ending violence against women as a critical conduit to addressing climate change. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Very, very powerful remarks. Uh, and I think hopefully we can all walk away with the importance of taking an intersectional lens to the climate work that we do. When we say we want a just, sustainable transition, uh, it can't be just if 50% of the population and 50% of the world's potential are left out of it. So thank you so much for these powerful remarks, and we look forward to taking it with us on our climate journeys. Thank you. Climate crisis has affected our livelihood, food security, and our peaceful existence in our community. So with the severe weather patterns, out of season cyclones, twin cyclones, 48 hours one after the other on the same week, as we watch it life destroying our homes, gardens, small businesses, roads, bridges, health centers, Market House, this is our realities. As a result, this, there is a lot of stress at home. As you do not know how to start tomorrow, the psychological stress, emotional stress that bring tension in the family, you will hear women screaming from beating because there is no decent meal on the table or refuse to give money for cover. The women with disability already live under marginalization, neglect, and rejection. Therefore, they suffer from family violence and community violence. Because of what I have mentioned about the food stress, they are triple effect. One of the things that we have seen work really well is the tool that we have introduced called ActionAid, woman-led community-based protection tool. This tool allows women to identify protection issues before, during, and after a disaster or climate crisis. It allows to bring out violence against women as it is and allows them to find solution to the problem for short-term and long-term. Economic empowerment for women is critical when they have their own income they can put food on the table and also negotiate with their partners this is the most important aspect of the program it allows women to make their own choices and decision and build up their confidence awareness raising on intimate partner violence is not common, but it plays a big role of the solution. 
of ending violence against women. Women and communities are made aware that it is not acceptable and it is not normalized practice. Therefore, there is safe spaces where that conversation is held. We are already on the pathway. Building the women's movement, providing to them what violence-free society looks like, supporting them with their economic hubs. And one of our recent proud moments is with Sunshine, where women with disability have their own outfit. Pacifica, Pacifica, power, Pacifica, power. So let's dive into some solutions. Uh, so honor our panel here today, a group of superstars. We have Jaha uh, Dukera, activist in Spotlight Initiative champion. We have Hira Ahmad, a younger woman in gender working group. We have Casey Camp Horin, uh, ENGO as well. Uh, we have Dr. Me uh, Meghna uh, Ranganathan from LSHTM. So thank you so much for being here today, and let's dive into these, to these solutions. So we know that the climate crisis and gender-based violence uh, and violence against women and girls, we know that these are very, very interlinked. So what can the international community do better uh, and more urgently to both address the climate crisis, but also its underlying drivers, gender-based violence, uh, and violence against women and girls? So what's missing, in your opinions, in the conversations today? Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, my name is Jaha and I'm originally from the Gambia. And I think 66% of women in our region of Africa are already employed in the agricultural sector. But you do realize that patriarchal, discriminatory, and violent norms keep women from being successful in a lot of the agricultural production that's happening in Africa and mainly due to lack of access to land. And then you also have issues like child marriage that continue to impact women and girls in our region. I myself being someone who was subjected to child marriage twice in my life. And the work that I've done with the Spotlight Initiative, for example, in Liberia, you see that, you know, agriculture and the climate crisis, it impacts women more than anyone else, but they don't have the same access to resources. And the international community, as well as a lot of people that are working on climate issues, if we are really serious about the climate crisis, I think reskilling women in agriculture and upskilling women and ensuring that they have access to not only land and resources, but that they are also well trained in um, ways that they can mitigate the climate crisis, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you. And we'll move over to you. Thank you. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very briefly, my name is Hiram Jad, and I'm also the executive director of the Sukh Women Rights and Awareness Foundation, a nonprofit that works on STBV, SRHR, and climate crisis in Pakistan. Very briefly, um, 33 million people were impacted by floods in Pakistan last year. And over the course of last 75 years, 25 massive floods have experienced by people in my country. And the rates have been ever increasing. Some three months ago, I was back in the community working with the women who have been impacted by floods. And the two core recommendations that I have for the international community are as follows. Invest in local women organizations, empower them, give them the resources to build those connections that are needed with women. Because I had this interaction with young women who were displaced at community level, and I was talking to them about their experiences and what has happened to them because they had been climate refugees for almost a year. And they said that the fact that you have come here and you're listening to us, you are asking us what we really need has actually relieved a lot of stress on our part. So women want to be heard, they need to be heard, and they need and they want to talk to women at grassroots and community level. So investing in local women organizations, their leadership, their capacity building is very, very important. The second most important thing that we have identified because of our work is empowering, educating, but simultaneously also investing in the well-being and care of women human rights defenders who are working at the intersection of climate crisis and gender-based violence. 
women human rights defenders face exacerbated bouts of violence from the local community as well as uh, as well as restrictions from the communities at grassroots level so it's very important to work and collaborate with local government organizations policy makers and other stakeholders in different communities and governments to build those bridges that can facilitate them that can grant them access points to women who are vulnerable and impacted by climate crisis at grassroots level in various communities and countries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very important remarks. And Casey. Here's one here. Thank you. Latia, Panka, Oklahoma. Judy is my true name. I'm a member of the Panka of Oklahoma in the United States of America. I'm a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother, a companion, a survivor a witness to the Holocaust that's happened to my people for the last hundreds of years that's come down through the uh, knowledges of all of the grandmothers and the mothers and the fathers. I want to first reach out to the men who are here and to say thank you to you for taking this time in your life. You must have good mamas, good sisters, good grandmas, to have brought you along to be able to, to uplift the voices of the women because the women are the path to the future and the clear understanding of what has happened in the past. I'm here with, as a delegate with the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network. I'm part of the uh, matriarchy of the Ponca Nation and serve as the environmental ambassador. We are a people. We are a people. I look at this panel and I see women of color. I see women. And I want to remind you that any violence against our mother, the earth, is a violence against women. I want to remind you that as protectors, as wisdom keepers, as the seeds of resistance that have always been, that we also have the answers and the keys to a sustainable future. But those have to be listened to. I thank you for continuing to stay here and not just go to your next event, and, but to the things that you said, as well as the other women, were very valuable to listen to. Drugs, the violence that comes with them on the reservations that we live on as a result of the extractive industry has to be stopped now and there has to be a clear path now. That's what's missing, a clear path to stop the extractive industry from coming into indigenous lands, to quit using resources, take off that RE, everything that they mine that they defile, that they steal, is a source of life, including our wombs, including the memories that we have, that we carry forth from time immemorial, that are part of our cellular beings, that can tell you viable ways for us to live in a good way with our Mother Earth, with the winds, this thing that you call solar energy, come on, isn't that just part of the natural law? Isn't it the natural law for the moon to guide the waves of the mother ocean? Isn't it the natural law for the fires to burn at a specific time? Isn't it part of the natural law for the thunders to come at a certain time? what has created the difference in how it used to be and how it is now. It is men in the extractive industry. It is patriarchy. It is looking at everything as a commodity as opposed to a sacred source of life. So the disconnect is not one just of the umbilical cord when the men leave our bodies, but the disconnect is the colonized mind that has forgotten its connection with all that is. And so for me, when I see where it is that we have to be, we have the largest incarcer incarceration in Oklahoma of indigenous people and of women, and 
we have the largest oil and gas production. We have drugs that are coming in constantly, methamphetamine and others that are the violence that are causing the, the kind of domestic issues that we have. There's a direct link. No more data is needed. No more studies are needed. Action is needed now. Civil society, get out there in the streets if you have to. Thank you. Men and women here, how many people are you connected to? Thank you. Powerful remarks. Thank you. Hello. Okay. It should be on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think it's a really hard um, act to follow right now, but I commend you on, on your comments, and I'm you know, in complete uh, solidarity with all that you've said. Um, so just to introduce myself, um, I'm uh, Meghna Ranganathan. I'm an assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I've also uh, done uh, work with the United Nations Population Fund. Um, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity for listening, as well as to give me this floor to speak. Um, I think in terms of, I have sort of just three with such a complex set of drivers that that is involved in this intersection because before we all as a community started recognizing climate and the impacts of climate on violence against women the, the drivers of gender-based violence itself are you know linked to so at, at, a, at an ecological level that's linked to so many different areas of somebody's life whether it's individual relational societal or environment or at the community level. So all the, when I think about, when I talk about what we could do as, as an international community, I think the evidence needs to be strengthened. I think there is evidence to show there's an issue, but there isn't enough data to um, look at how we could improve on existing um, interventions. So because we are thinking about these core beneficial interventions where women need to be protected, where we want to build climate resilience, but we also need to consider gender norms that are an issue, we really do need to think about um, what kind of research can we do to inform these interventions. So it's not just in, uh, evidence on the linkages, but it's also evidence to show what works, how it works, for whom it works, and in what context. Because with when we think about livelihood interventions that are climate resilient, when we think about changing norms in a community, it is so context specific and so locally driven that it needs to be really owned by the community and the research methods that we use need to be really taking into account practices that the community are already uh, using to collect their own data. So, uh, but alongside that, it would be helpful for the international community to finance more sort of strengthened systems where the, there's multi-sectoral collaboration between ministries as as a speakers before this mentioned as well. So when you have, you know, the Ministry for Planning, the Ministry for Health, the Ministry for Gender, coming together to think about how do you finance these kinds of multi-sectoral interventions, you're more likely to have core benefits that are, you know, it allows us to then follow the money. I think it's important to think about social protection programs that are already at the national level and a lot of governments are running it. How do you make these social protection programs more adaptive to climate change and then link it up with uh, community, women's rights groups that, uh, that work on gender norms? So in that case, you have these you know, really, it's a complex intervention, but these are interventions that can actually work at the local level because they're already at, at different stages in different countries. So it's really about grounding the work in the community and it should be by the community. But I think as a researcher coming into this, I also think that we need what's called intervention development research. You, you th develop the research, you think about how it's working and then modify it to make sure that it's really working for the people that have designed it. So uh, ensuring that it's a co-design uh, piece of work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and in our, our kind of final round of questioning, and I'd say about 30 seconds or less if you can, what is your vision or your organization's vision for a just climate transition and a violence-free one at that? And we can go in the same order. 
I mean, I think we need to start looking at violence against women and girls in a different lens and understand that women in every instance are in everywhere around the world are affected by a number of violences. And when we look at the climate issue, we shouldn't exclude it from women's issues. Climate issues are women's issues, just like they are human issues. Everything that impacts humanity, women are more vulnerable to a lot of these issues. And when we come up with solutions, we cannot exclude them out of those solutions. Without the inclusion of women in the climate conversation and without the linkage to violence against women and girls alone, I think we'll just be doing a lot of talking without any action. Thank you. So my vision is a more inclusive climate policy that includes women and girls. Thank you. And here. I'm definitely going to echo what you said because uh, you see climate crisis does not discriminate, but we do. When decisions are being made about women, uh, you know, when conversations are being done about them, they are really ever part of the conversation. They are really ever seen at the table. And that is something that really, really needs to be addressed. I was just seeing a photo of COP where leaders were standing who were making and taking decisions. And I had to pick point where women were. That needs to change. That needs to address. Young people need to be at the table. We need to have our voices heard. But at the same time, we also have to build a connection with communities back home. That's my vision. I want to be connected with the community that I'm representing at this platform. Because when I'm sitting here talking about these experiences, talking about these challenges, challenges, I'm not just representing myself and my organization, but all of those women that I have worked with. And I carry that responsibility with me everywhere. So a vision of a world where the policies are more inclusive, more equitable table where our voices are heard and we are all sitting together deciding for our future collectively. Thank yeah, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And Casey as well. So here's my list. Implement the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Declare a climate emergency at the UN level and at the local level. Among the Oglala Lakota, in about oh, maybe, it was November, they declared an emergency there due to the violence, the crime, and the drugs that were in their territory. Within our sovereignty, we can do things like that. So if you support the indigenous people, you are supporting yourself. And recognize that as we talk about being water protectors, land defenders, defenders of the future, the caretakers of the past, that we are not just protecting nature, that we as humans at this point, at this critical point, we are nature protecting itself. Mm -hmm. Declare a climate emergency. De make the fossil fuel phase itself out now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think if I was to, if I, since I only have two minutes, I would say the, the main points around ensuring that there's women's voices, both in terms of the design of interventions, um, in, in, in leading sort of the climate interven uh, in initiatives, as well as in safeguarding women in communities, but also building com women leadership when it comes to decision-making processes. And so that's really from the top level onwards when, you know, when we were talking about the nationally determined contributions that at the country level or the um, national action plans, we need to ensure that women's voices and women are in positions of leadership in country in order to really sort of push this intersection and this linkage further. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a researcher, so evidence is really important. I think both quantitative and qualitative evidence, as they say, we need sort of the hard numbers and data systems to, to ensure that we have, to, you know, we're able to look at 
uh, causality, as they say, but then you really do need lived experiences, participatory research with communities, led by the community, sort of peer-led approaches to ensure that the evidence base is one that's strong and that can lead to interventions that have co-benefits. And I think that's where we're actually, there's a missing puzzle right now. We, we know the evidence, but we don't actually have enough solutions. And it, hypothetically, we are aware that when you have a climate resilient solution that empowers women, that, it's protect, that it protects the environment, but at the same time, does that protect women from gender-based violence? Not necessarily, because we know that women's empowerment can also lead to a backlash from men. And so it's really important that men are alongside women in designing these interventions as well, as long as women, women's voices are front and center, but ensuring that women, men as stakeholders are part of the process of developing these types of community-led interventions interventions, then you're sort of tackling the traditional gender norms, which makes um, gender-based violence particularly a unique um, risk factor for women. Um, and finally, to say that it needs to be a rights-based uh, approach, it needs to be a gender-just approach, and it certainly needs to be absolutely locally and community-led from the start. So thank you. Thank you. Well done. We're going to open it up to, to the audience, um, but we're going to start first with we have two formal respondents. Uh, that are, we would ask to come speak to uh, the microphone, if that's okay, so that the microphone should be near you. Um, and our first speaker is Sarah uh, Piera, and she will be speaking in Portuguese, I believe. Um, so you're welcome to listen to Channel 7 for the translation. Um, thank you, and, and for the sake of time, if we can try to keep audience remarks to around one, one and a half minutes. Permisso. Boa tarde, eu sou Sara Pereira, agradeço o convite para esse diálogo tão importante com essas mulheres tão potentes. Eu venho da Amazônia brasileira, sou amazônida do estado do Pará, o estado que vai sediar a COP30. Sou de uma organização chamada FASE, que trabalha com educação popular e defesa de direitos e atuamos com mulheres diversas, como populações, como mulheres indígenas, agroestativistas, ribeirinhas, mulheres das cidades... Enfim, e esse tema é muito importante porque quando a gente pensa em soluções né, para a crise climática, e fiquei muito emocionada com a falar da companheira, porque me identifico plenamente com ela, de todos, mas é, de que não é impossível falar de soluções para a crise climática sem falar das causas dessa crise. Né? Quem provoca a crise climática não somos nós, as mulheres, sobretudo as mulheres desses territórios. Quem provoca a crise climática são os grandes países desenvolvidos, sobretudo o norte global, e que empurram para é, os países do sul global as, as consequências, né, a conta dessa crise climática. E, de fato, as mulheres são as primeiras afetadas. Thank you. Posso seguir? Sim. Tá. Ah, difícil, né? Call up. Can you do it again? Do we have someone who's going to translate what you just asked? Thank you. They're going to repeat it? We can hear the translation. Yes, we can. Channel one uh, is, is will be the English translation from the Portuguese. Vou retomar. Great, thank you. Yes, carry on. Bom, vou retomar e vou novamente me apresentar para que as companheiras possam é, saber quem sou eu, né? Sim, não. Yeah. Thanks. That's okay. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Eu sou Sara, Sara Pereira, venho da do Brasil, da Amazônia brasileira, do estado do Pará, o estado que vai sediar a COP30. É, sou coordenadora de uma organização chamada Fase Amazônia, que trabalha com educação popular e defesa de direitos e primeiramente agradeço o convite para participar de um debate tão importante com vozes tão potentes 
como de todas as mulheres que já me antecederam. E para falar de soluções de crise climática, é, a gente não pode responder essa pergunta sem falar das causas dessa crise. Quem é que provoca a crise climática? Né? Não somos nós as mulheres, nem tampouco as mulheres que estão nos territórios é, amazônicos ou no, nos outros territórios. Né? E como bem disse a companheira que me antecedeu, né, quem, essa crise é provocada por um modelo de economia mundial baseada na indústria extrativa, não é? e no, nos territórios em que a fase atua, nós lidamos diretamente com mulheres que são vítimas desses modelos, dessas atividades econômicas predatórias, como a mineração, não é? que, além de é, espoliar os territórios, expulsa as mulheres desses territórios para a cidade. E aí a gente vai ter também problemas é, que afetam as mulheres nas periferias das grandes cidades. Não é? Mas, além... Do, da indústria mineral, também a gente tem os grandes, as grandes indústrias é, dos monocultivos, a grande indústria da pecuária. Né? Nós temos, por exemplo, nos territórios que a gente atua, a, a empresa Cargill, que é uma exportadora de soja, em que cultiva soja tanto no estado do Pará, em dois territórios, e tem expulsado desses territórios mulheres agricultoras, familiares, agroestativistas, quilombolas, não é? Então, essas violações territoriais, elas precisam ser tratadas, porque, do contrário, nós vamos tratar um problema apenas como, como medida paliativa. Nós não vamos resolver a solução a longo prazo. Então, se nós não pautarmos as nossas discussões em um modelo de sociedade que, ao invés de termos uma economia centrada na exploração extrativa, mas que nós tenhamos economias diversas que respeitem as características, as particularidades dos seus territórios, economias que visibilizem as diversas formas produtivas dos territórios, como as atividades desenvolvidas pelas mulheres, na agroecologia, na produção de alimentos saudáveis. As mulheres são as grandes guardiões de saberes, não só é, de saberes é, individuais, mas sobretudo saberes coletivos no manejo da terra em respeito ao meio ambiente. Então, esse conhecimento ancestral que circula pelas mãos das mulheres precisa ser valorizado e respeitado. Então, qualquer solução que se quer ter resultado a longo prazo precisa partir das experiências locais. E eu não poderia deixar de visibilizar aqui uma injustiça que, se, que acontece no meu país, no Brasil, em que uma empresa mineradora, a, a mineradora Braskem, que derrubou é, uma comunidade, diversas comunidades no estado de Maceió e vem aqui para a COP tratar de economia circular. É uma grande contradição. Então, esses tipos de contradições, que infelizmente não é um caso isolado, eles não podem passar desapercebidos. Então, a solução para a crise climática está, sim, no reconhecimento dos povos tradicionais, dos povos originários, dos diversos povos e, sobretudo, das mulheres. Obrigada. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, and we'll move right to, to Flora Vano, uh, if you could take the mic. Uh, and we're down to just about two minutes, uh, but thank you so much for your powerful remarks. Hello. Hi. Thank you for this opportunity. I think I had a video that played at the very first session of this panel, and I've said a lot already on that uh, video. I'd like to start by um, acknowledging all women that are up here and Standing here with me are voices of the women at the front line and at the marginalized women, girls and women with disability from the Pacific and all the other marginalized community around the world. We work with rural women and communities. We did not ignore the traditional knowledge. We acknowledge it and bridge in the scientific part of where they are not able to. We support women on their livelihood to address financial violence, to address emotional violence, to address physical violence. We support women to grow their own resilient crop as well, so they can have food on the table. They do not need to beg, they do not need to ask their husband for money or food, which means peace at home, which means less violence. Community violence is low when women are busy doing climate resilient, sustainable agricultures, rehabilitation of ecosystem through the nature-based solution that we are connected to as women, connected to our land, connected to our oceans. 
Climate change, we have seen from the work we did, is a platform where when there's a patriarchy system, like in my country, this is the platform where we uh, used to have this dialogue on sensitive issues for gender-based violence, intermediate partner violence. It's not common in our world to start talking about it openly. It's very sensitive. So therefore, when we talk on climate change platform, it allows the discussion to happen. And it also provides that safe space for women and girls and women with disability to voice that concern and their issues and find solutions. The work that we do actually ties in in a framework of ActionAid, woman-led community-based protection too. And it allows women to identify issue on a normal time and also on disaster times. And those issues, they need to find solution, short-term solution, immediate solution, and also long-term solution. So we have seen that when you equip women with tools, they take the tools and they were responsible to make sure that their community are safe and they address all form of violence. So climate change is cross-cutting. In women's world, we've seen it, it's a driving uh, platform for women to talk more about the issues and find solutions to it. And we have seen it work where we normalized violence. It became normalized already in most of our community because of the patriarchy system. Therefore, when climate change is in the discussion, it allows women to have a seat on the table. It allows women to also be there to give their opinion on issues that are very critical for them on a daily basis. For me to conclude, support inclusive woman leadership Invest in that. Equations of a violence-free future, we need to support the women leadership to thrive and we will have a violence-free future. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. And I'll say we have only about 20 seconds. So I want to conclude by saying uh, an important question that we need to ask is whose voice isn't represented. Uh, it's going to take local action and local solutions, which means we need local voices at all the tables. And we've heard time and time again here today that evidence is also important to build policies around. So what questions can you ask in the work that you do that could help build some of that information, build some of that evidence that we can pass over to policymakers? Uh, a warm round of applause for our incredible panel here today. Thank you. May I? Yeah. I just want to encourage everyone to recognize that, that they need to recognize and respect the rights of nature to exist mm -hmm. and that we are that. And that uh, Climate Action Network also has a really good study that you might want to look at. I'm going to leave this down here so you can come and whatever those little things are, you can take a picture of it and use it. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. Well done.